So you take derivative of this one first, which is 2x times what? The der that's the 2 coming up. Then you have to take derivative of x, which is dx dt. Right? Because we're differentiating with respect to t, not with respect to x. And then times y squared. So that's the first part of the product rule. Now I do derivative of this times that. So derivative, I do plus. So derivative of y squared is what? 2y, 2y dy dt, and then times x squared. So that is the product rule on the first two terms, differentiating everything with respect to t. Then plus derivative of sine of y is cosine y times the derivative of what's in here with respect to time. So you get what? dy dt. And that takes care of the left side of the equation. On the right side of the equation, derivative of x dx dt. And then derivative of 4 is 0. So that would be it. And then you would have to isolate dx dt. So you would have to get this term and this term on one side of the parentheses and take everything else to the other side of the parentheses, <coughs> factor out a dx dt, and then divide through. I won't do that, but I just want, I want to make sure you know how to take this derivative. All right? This reminds me of a story. This dx right here, the derivative of x. I met this girl one time at a club, and I asked, I asked her what the derivative of x was. It's a long story I'm not going to get into, but I didn't have a lot of time when I was in grad school for social hour, you know? So whenever I'd meet someone out at a bar, I'd always ask them like a minimum bare math question just to make sure we could at least communicate a little bit. So I used to ask like, what's the derivative of x? And um, this, this girl I met this one time, she says, her answer was, with respect to what variable? And I was like, yes. Because the, the derivative of x is 1. Like in most people's eyes, the derivative of x is 1. But truly, it depends on what you're differentiating with respect to. If you differentiate with respect to t, well, then the derivative of x is dx dt. So that's a more profound question. Anyway. All right, we good? You got your grade? 10, they're 10 points each. There's 10 of them, so just. Tally it on up, give yourself an honest grade, and let's turn them in. <clears throat> so just kind of pass them together and kind of get them all, let's try and get all the quizzes to this table. Got it? So look, this, this quiz, although I do not expect necessarily that we walk in on day one and you're like at the, at the top of your game with your calculus, all of the calculus in this quiz is on a level like from zero being your breathing and ten being like the hardest math you've ever done. Like this should all be to you like, like below a five. This should all be below five. This is nothing here was was way out of out of out there. Okay, this is all stuff in Cal One you should be comfortable with. So if you are not there, you need to start figuring out what you can do to get yourself here, because the the thing about Cal Two, I, I've promised it's going to be hard. I've promised that, and I will deliver on that. Okay, but what's part of the difficulty is that the material comes very quickly. It's challenging, and then you have to master it and understand it by the next time we meet. So when I'm doing something, remember I said we're going to learn about doing antiderivatives? Something that we cover, a topic, the next class I'm going to need that topic to do the new topic. So if you can't do that part, then you're, you're kind of dead in the water at that point. Does that make sense? So a lot of times we'll have a real complicated problem. I'll teach you this new way of trying to get it back to something. I'll be like, ah, we did that last class. Okay, we'll just stop there. We don't need to worry about it now. Does that make sense? So, all right. 
I was sitting here while you were taking the quiz, and I was thinking to myself of a, a bonus. I have, I have, a, I have an, an option. What do you all think of this opportunity for bonus? You come into my office, and we sit down one-on-one -on -one for, let's say, five to ten minutes. I'm hoping more like ten, all right? And in that time, I'm going to assess you. In some way, I'm going to try and figure out, like, where you are, whether it be, like, hey, you know what, you're working 40 hours a week, what, like you're going through a divorce, like, oh my gosh, you have eight kids, like, if it's that co sort of conversation where I'm trying to like figure out what you're trying to balance in your life right now to try and kind of get some idea of whether or not you're overloading yourself, or if it's a conversation like, hey, look, let me give you this problem, just work through it, I'm going to watch you, and just so I can see like, oh yeah, you know, the algebra here is weak, or something like that, that way we can... I just kind of want to, like, instead of just seeing y'all show up, I just kind of like each one of you want to have the opportunity to just know a little bit more about you. If you are willing to take 10 minutes out of your time to come into my office during my office hours or schedule an appointment with me if, if those hours don't work, then I will give you uh, five points on your final exam. Okay? It's, it's a bonus. It's an, op it's an option. You can take it or leave it. All right? All you have to do is uh, show up during my office hours, be like, hey, I'd like to, to sit down with you for 10 minutes. Um, that might be difficult though because if I have students there. Give me this week to um, look into something. There's something in Canvas where I can set up a calendar where you can go in and like request a, a, a meeting with me and then we can lock in a date and a time that you come in for that 10 minutes and that way I'm expecting you and I don't commit myself to anybody else. All right? Let me look into that. I'll get back with you next week on that. Okay? All right. I have, I have successfully destroyed almost the entire class. Not destroyed, I hope it was valuable. We, we have 30 minutes to cover one section. So let's get to it. Um, <clears throat> the quiz grade here, I will take this as your first quiz grade. If it's very poor, then um, if you come in for those 10 minutes, I will change this to 100. All right? What is the time frame on that? And when we would go to the new year? As in, like, is it just this month? Or oh, no, the whole semester. Okay. Yep. Yep. It, it, sometime before the final. But, <laughs> but if, at the, if everyone tries to do it, like, the week before finals, like, if I can't fit it in, I can't fit it in. So I would I recommend getting that over with sooner than later. Because I'd like to know more about y'all now than, like, two weeks before the end of the semester. But I can't force you, and, and I've actually thought about, um, for the longest time I've been trying to figure out a way where I don't give exams, that I actually just like take a student and for two hours we sit in a room on a whiteboard and do math. And I figure out like, are, is this person like really a Cal 2 level student, you know? Like if I, I can just sit with someone for two hours and do math and I can know a lot about them. But I just don't have, that's not realistic, you know? So we'll just do tests instead. All right, so we're going to talk about inverse signs, uh, the inverse trig functions. Sorry. I'm going to go through this very quickly. Why am I going to go through this quickly? Because I've ruined the whole class already, right? Um, kind of. Um, because this is stuff from pre-cal, all right? That's why. So this is a review. So don't try and copy everything I have down here, all right? Um, <clears throat> First of all, there's a definition here of a uh, one-to-one -one function. One-to-one -one function just means that if you have a function, that if you plug a value into it, a single value into it, it goes out to a single value, right? So like, for example, if you take like the x squared function, x squared, if I plug in two, what do I get? The squared function. If I plug in two, it spits out four, right? If I plug in negative 2, it spits out 4. That is not 1 to 1. Because you should, the 4 on this side should only come from one place. All right? So that is not an example of a 1 to 1 function. An easy way to check for 1 to 1, uh, whether or not a function is 1 to 1, is whether or not it passes the horizontal line test. You remember that? OK. So for a function to be 1 to 1, it must pass both the vertical and horizontal line tests. So back in uh, pre-cal, 
we were looking at the trig function like sine and we asked ourselves, <coughs> is there an inverse function for sine? And if you look at it just like this, you would say no, right? Because it, it fails the horizontal line test. So what do we do in order to kind of work around that, that problem? We had a domain restriction. We basically cut this function up and only looked at it in a certain place. Let's look at cosine. There's cosine in green. Is that one to one? No, not unless we do something with it, right? How about the tangent function? You should recognize that with, oop, with all of its vertical asymptotes. That's not one to one. You draw a horizontal line, you're gonna punch through the function a bunch of times. All six trig functions, all six trig functions are not one to one unless we restrict their domains. So back in pre-cal, we did that. <clears throat> so like on the sine function, what we did was we restricted it right there, just between negative pi over two and pi over two. And in that restriction, we get the entire range, we get the whole uh, range of the function from negative one to one, and we get it on a nice little inter compact interval from negative pi over two to pi over two. So we did that for sine, and with that we defined what we call the arc sine function. And it's written one of these two ways. And there's domain restrictions, and we talked about that in pre-cal. <coughs> and that is the graph of the inverse. I'm oh, sorry, that's a graph of sine. Here's its inverse. So the red one is the sine function restricted to between negative pi over two and pi over two, and the blue one is its inverse function. And they are mirror images of one another over the, if you look at a diagonal line and you reflect these, they will land on top of each other. Is that a coincidence? That happens with all functions. If there is an inverse, then they are reflections of one another over the uh, diagonal. Anybody know what that diagonal is called? Uh, it's like, an oblique, but I'm, I'm talking about the, the diagonal that's f of x equals x. It's a very special function. We call it the, no, the identity function. f of x equals x is called the identity, and it's just the diagonal that cuts through at 45 degrees. So if you imagine a 45 degree line here, reflect it over and you we will land on top of itself. All right. Hold on. Let's look at uh, let's look at these two real quick. What is arc sine of one? So what this is really asking you is sine of what angle is one? Ninety degrees. So you you have to you have to be very comfortable in this class with the unit circle. So unit circle has special angles on it, right? Like 30, 60, uh, 30, 45, 60, 90, blah, 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 all those angles. And then for each one of these, there's a very, very nice point that you should have memorized or something by now, right? You got all these special like root two over two, root two over two, okay, blah, blah, blah. So when you're saying at what angle is sine equal to one, Sine corresponds to which coordinate on the unit circle? The y. the y coordinate. So this is really asking you, where's the y coordinate um, one? Where's the y coordinate one? And that happens right here. That's the point zero one, right? So the angle that corresponds to that is either 90 degrees or pi over two. I prefer you use pi over two, all right? Okay, good. Now, what about this one? root three over two. So arc sine of root three over two is asking the same question. Sine of what angle is root three over two? So this is saying where's the y coordinate root three over two? And where does that happen? That should be happening here, right? The y coordinate here, this is one half and this is root three over two, right? Is that the only angle where the y coordinate is root three over two? There's another one over here, right? But why aren't we considering that one? Because the domain restriction of arc sine, the domain restriction of arc sine says you're only allowed to look between where? Negative pi over two and pi over two. So if this is zero degrees, pi over two is straight up, right? Negative pi over two is straight down. We are not even allowed to look over here in the second or the third quadrants. So no answers from those quadrants are, are 
allowed, right? That's what allows us to be able to have an answer here, not, not two answers. So what's the answer? Power of three. Okay. We move on. This is just pre-cal. I think the next one I do is I talk a little bit about arc cosine. Yeah, so we take the cosine function and we do a similar restriction. I don't have a picture of it. Uh, we do a restriction of the cosine, but instead of being between negative pi over 2 and pi over 2, we do what for cosine? Zero, Zero to pi. So your restriction is actually, you're, you're not looking in the bottom two for arc cosine, you're just the, just the top two quadrants. Okay. All that's great, but uh, I'm, not, I'm just going to skip the cancellation problem. But uh, this is Cal 2, so why are we going back and reviewing pre-Cal? Because we actually never uh, talked about this in Cal 1, or maybe you did. Um, anyone do derivatives of the inverse trig functions in Cal 1? Yeah? Okay, that's good. Um, so we want to know what the derivative of that inverse function is. So that's what we're going to start with. I want to know if there's a way that we can determine what y prime is here. So if y is equal to this inverse function, which we've defined already, and we, we, we studied that in, in pre-cal and we graphed it, but what is its derivative? Could we find the slope of the tangent line on that graph? Well, you could find the derivative by just looking in the back of the book and getting a formula, right? It's there. But where does that come from? So that's what we're going to do here. We're going to actually derive the formula for this derivative. And the way we're going to do it is going to require a couple of things. We have to be able to, number one, use implicit differentiation. And number two, we need to be able to use what are called reference triangles. So I'm going to work this out, and you'll see them. both of those um, things happen. So I start this problem out. I'm trying to take the derivative. Well, do we know what the derivative? I want dy dx, OK? Do I know what the derivative of y is with respect to s? Dy, dy dx, OK, great. But do I know the derivative of this? No, that's what I want to find, right? So I can't just differentiate right now. I can't, because the right side, I don't know what to do with it. So instead, what we do is we take sine on both sides of the equation. And the point of that is that on the right side, using the cancellation property, we should just get what on the right side? Just x. So long as x is within the certain domain restrictions and blah, blah, blah. But we should algebraically get x. And then we have sine y. Now, can we take the derivative on both sides of the equation implicitly with respect to x? Yes. So let's take the derivative on the left side. This is telling you that I'm taking the derivative on the left side with respect to x. And this is telling you I'm taking the derivative on the right side with respect to x. So this is just representing that I'm coming in here taking the derivative on both sides. So I'm, I'm, we call this a differential operator. So this is just showing you the operation that I'm about to do. So on the left side, what is the derivative of sine y? Cosine y. Are you done? No. no. You then have chain rule. You have to take derivative of y. And that's dy dx. And then on the right side, what is the derivative of x with respect to x? Just 1. And what were we trying to find? dy dx. dy dx. So we're actually very close to having an answer here. If I divide both sides by cosine y, wouldn't I get this? Yes. And that is correct. If y is equal to the arc sine of x, the derivative of it, the derivative of y would be 1 over cosine y. The problem with leaving it like this is that the answer has y in it as opposed to x. So what we want to do for this last step is to, tr to take this right-hand side and see if we can't rewrite it in terms of x. I could also write 1 over cosine y as what? What is 1 over cosine? What's the reciprocal? Secant, right? So this is, this is secant y, right? But I don't like the y. I'm going to get rid of it. So here's where, I, here's where the reference triangle comes in. 
So where is it? Okay. So do you all see this, this statement right here? Before we took the derivative, do you see that statement? Okay. From that statement, I'm going to draw a right triangle. And this is what I'm talking about when I say a reference triangle. We'll be doing a lot of reference triangles in here. All right, so here's a reference triangle. We know that by definition, sine of an angle, sine of an angle is opposite, what is it? Sine is opposite over hypotenuse, right? Don't remember that? So I'm gonna just kind of like come in here and just be very kind of clever and I'm gonna, I'm gonna use that equation to, to generate a picture. If I call the angle Y here, then if I call this opposite side X and I call this hypotenuse one, would this, wouldn't this triangle represent what's happening here? Why did I put a one on the hypotenuse? Because this is really X over one, right? So this is opposite over hypotenuse. So do you all agree that that triangle represents what's happening in this equation? Okay, now I'm interested in knowing what cosine Y is, right? So looking at this picture, isn't cosine adjacent over hypotenuse? Now, do you know what the adjacent side is? It's not given to you, right? But you could solve for it, because you have two sides of a right triangle. So A squared plus B squared must be C squared. So you could solve for this, and I would hope, maybe it'll take you a little bit, a little, little bit of time, but could you get that? Yeah, you feel good, you can get that? Okay, if you don't know how to get that, just put a star and talk to me. All right, so this side is this, right? So what would cosine of y be then? This over this, right? Adjacent over hypotenuse, which would just be that. So this is really one over square root of one minus x squared. And that is the derivative of arc sine of x. That's the formula that would appear in the back of the book. If you wanna know what the derivative of that is, um, sorry, I should somehow, the derivative is this, all right? I'm not saying that arc sine is that, but the derivative of it is that. Questions? So I will just go back and make sure we understand that if we take this picture right here, that is the arc sine function right there. So long as I pick a value to plug in here that's between negative one and one, as long as I pick a value between negative one and one, like let's say I took this number like 0.67 right there, and I plugged it in here, I could find the slope of that tangent line. What would the slope of that, how would I calculate the slope of that tangent line? I take 0.67, plug it in right there, figure it out, and I would get an answer, and that would be the slope of that tangent line, all right? All right, so that's, that was a two-step process um, for this, for finding the derivative of that. I took, uh, well, I guess you could say a three-step process almost. I took sine on both sides, I differentiated with respect to x, I used a reference triangle, and then filled in what I needed. So you could go back and look at the notes. I'm scrolling down further. Uh, well, I guess in your homework, you have an opportunity to derive the formula for cosine inverse. And I think there's one for tangent inverse, but they're all done the same way. You think you can do that on your own? Try it? Okay. All right, but now that we have the derivative, just like we did in Cal 1, once we have a formula, then we can do all sorts of derivatives using chain rule, product rule, quotient rule, all that good stuff. So what about this one here? What if we wanted to find the derivative with respect to x of arc sine of the square root of x squared plus one. So what if we, oh, and I remember there was a problem with this one. Um, you know what, let's change this. I, I've never changed this in all the semesters. Let's just change this right here to one minus x squared. 
there's a domain issue there, so we'll do that instead. All right, the only thing we have right now is that if you take the derivative of arc sine of x, it's equal to 1 over the square root of 1 minus x squared, right? That's the formula that we just came up with. So now we're asked to find the derivative of arc sine of all of this stuff, right? So let's do this. This should be equal to, um, I'm going to do a chain rule here, right? So I'm trying to take the derivative of arc sine of all this crap in here, right? Which is kind of like just the little x here. So it should be 1 over the square root of 1 minus what? So that's just me using this formula, but I'm not plugging x in. What am I plugging in? The square root of 1 minus x, but then all of that squared, which is going to kill off the root. Am I done? No, because no, chain rule says now I've done the derivative of the arc sine part. Now I need to actually do the derivative of the orange part. In the orange part, what's the derivative of the square root of something? Yeah, so this is another one that in my calculus classes I try and stress. You should just get used to this. The derivative of the square root of, of x is just 1 over 2 root x. 1 over 2 root x. I, I just say burn this into your brain. You may have learned it that you, know, you rewrite that as to the half, and then you do 1 half x to the negative 1 half, which is correct, but then you drop that down. and Oh, that's a negative. And then it's the same thing, all right? So I prefer just you just kind of memorize it more like a template that you plug into. So what I have for this, the derivative of the square root of that is 1 over 2 roots of 1 minus x squared. Am I done now? Still not done with my derivative. Now I take derivative of what's inside, this piece. And that derivative is just negative 2x. So that's my differentiation. And I could clean it up, right? I could do here, here, those twos cancel. When I square this in here, I believe I just get, I think I just get that. I think those, when you square the square root, it goes away. And then the ones cancel, like this, this negative distributes and becomes a plus here right, when it distributes through. So you get 1 minus 1 plus x squared. So you get just that. And then over here, you get x and then root 1 minus x squared. And what about this? This is like an x, and it cancels here. Now, technically speaking, <coughs> what is the square root of x squared by definition? It's not just x. Technically, it's absolute value of x. All right, so if that wasn't clear to you in the past, just make sure you understand. Now, a lot of times what we do is we just turn this into x, but that's under the assumption that x is positive. x could possibly be negative. So, so in that case, this would be just the absolute value of x. And so long as x was positive, yeah, that would cancel. But if x is negative, See, what if, what if we plug negative 1 half in for x right here? We would actually get a negative out here. It would be negative 1 half over 1 half. You get negative 1. All right. My time is, is coming to an end here. I've got 10 minutes, but let me see what else. Um, hmm. I don't think I'm going to get through example 4. And example five. So why don't I do this? I'll, I'll give you example four and example five as a take home to be turned in next class. All right. So you already have two things due next class. What are they? The quiz that says you're checking your life away on the syllabus, right? And then these two problems. I'm going to do 3.5 in the last 10 minutes. Um, I should also mention to you that, um, you know when you go to look at the homework solutions 
or when you go to look at these lecture videos there on YouTube, if you just go to my channel and go to my playlists, I have Calculus 2 videos from, from semesters in the past. So if you ever want to watch something from the past, I'm covering the same material. So if you ever wanted to like get ahead a little bit, like see it before you come in here, you could. Just, just mentioning that. All right, check this problem out. Okay, Ten minutes. Right, so this is yeah. Notes. This yeah. is in the lecture notes. Sorry. I'll put this back up at the end of class. You can come up and snap a picture of, if you want. But it is in the lecture notes. Um, example six. A rocket is fired straight up with a speed <laughs> 100,000 miles per hour. Or sorry, 1,000 miles per hour. Um, an observer who is a mile away from the launch point is tracking the rocket with binoculars. At the moment, the rocket is three miles high. How fast is the observer's angle of inclination changing? Um, what is that in degrees per second? All right, so after sitting there and reading that a few more times, you realize the question has an observer sitting here. I'm just going to look at the observer as a point. You have a rocket that was launched up and is going up like that. Oh, you know what? I have fire. There we go. Okay, so there we go. I took an art class this summer, as you can tell. Spent a lot of time learning more about drawing. Um, so the, the rocket is traveling at a speed of 1,000 miles per hour. The observer is one mile away. So this is one mile no matter what, right? What type of problem is this, by the way? This is a related rate problem. This is a related rate problem. We want to know at exactly the moment that the rocket is three miles high, how fast the angle of inclination is changing. So if you imagine a line going from here to the rocket, from the observer to the rocket, there's an angle here called theta. And I want to know how fast that angle is changing at exactly the moment that the rocket is three miles high. So this really is going to go back to how you learn this. Okay, and I know for every instructor it's a little bit different. So I, what I'm going to show you here it may look completely foreign to you. Hopefully it looks somewhat similar. But the way I do it is I have my students draw two pictures. I have one picture which I call the general picture. And then I have an instant or what we call the moment picture. So in the general picture, the rocket's actually moving. Okay, it's actually the rocket's going up and the observer's head is turning, right? And in this picture, everything's changing. Theta's changing, and this distance right here, which I'll call y because it's vertical, that's changing, right? So y is changing, theta's changing. Now, is, is this changing? No, the one's not changing. So that picture is kind of like everything that's happening in general. Now, at the instant, it's like me taking the, a picture at the moment in time that we're talking about here. At the moment in time we're talking about, we have, oh, this is not drawn to scale, sorry. This is supposed to be three miles high, right? Okay. And then there is an angle here, theta. And do we know that? Could we find that angle? If, if someone said, hey, give me that angle, could we find it? Yeah, yeah we'd use like an arc tangent function on our calculator. But, so we have all those quantities, don't we? So instant snapshot, this is the general picture, everything's changing. So then I tell my students to give me some information um, or to write some things down. I ask them to say, what am I given in the problem and what do I want? Those are the two things. So what am I given? I'm given the rate that the rocket is traveling, right? The speed of the rocket and the speed of something is the derivative, right? Derivative is velocity, so I'm given dy dt the rate at which y changes with respect to time is 1,000 miles per hour, mph, right? What do I want to know? I want to know how fast the angle is changing with respect to time. I want to know d theta t, dt, but do I want it at, at any particular point? No, at, at, at exactly, I want this when what? When y is 3. That's what I want. Three miles, if you want, you can put three miles. So I'm given how fast y changes. I want to know how fast theta is changing at a specific instant in time. So the next part of the problem is to come up with an equation that somehow relates theta and y together. 
And which picture do you look at? Well, you're going to look at the general picture. Sometimes we don't have a picture, depending on what the problem is. But in this one, we have this picture. So we always look at the general picture. Is there a way that you, connect, you can connect theta and y together? What would you use to connect them? What's that? Tangent, right? You know this side's 1, never changes. You know this side's y. So you know the opposite side, you know the adjacent side, and here's the angle. So we have this relationship. Tangent of theta equals what? This over this, which is y, right? Now, in calculus 1, in Cal 1, at this point, you would differentiate that equation with respect to t, right? I'm going to do that, but, but I want you to understand um, that we're actually going to do something different, like from today. But I want you to see what would happen if I just did like what, what you could have done without um, even attending class today. You take derivative tangent theta, which is secant squared theta, d theta dt. So derivative tangent of something is secant squared of it, then the derivative of the inside of it is d theta dt. Equals what? d y dt. So I've differentiated both sides of the equation with respect to time. Are you all comfortable with that? Now what are we trying to solve for? d theta dt. We're trying to solve for this, right? So it's good that it's there. What are we going to need to know in order to solve this problem? We need to know dy dt. Do we know it? Yes. yes. Uh, yeah, it's right there, right? So we know that. What else do we need to know in order to solve this problem? Theta. We need to know what theta is. And we do, do we know what theta is? Not yet, but we could find it, right? OK, so we would be in business here. But what if we use what we learned today? What if instead of doing this equation, I took arctangent on both sides? Now, we didn't mess with the arctangent function yet, right? We only did arc sine. But I told you, there's formulas for arc, tan uh, for arc sine, arc cosine, arc tangent, all of them. And they're in your book, and then they're um, in the formula sheets. All right? So if I do this, what's the left side of that equation become? What is it? Just theta equals arc tangent of, y, of y. Now, check this out. If we take this equation and differentiate it with respect to time, what's the left side? d theta dt, right? Now, the derivative of arctangent, I didn't give you the formula for it. I said you could go home and derive that, but I'll, I'll write it down over here just so you can see it. The derivative of arctangent of x is 1 over 1 plus x squared. This one is super, 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 one more super, one more super important, all right? This formula is used a lot in this class. The derivative of arctangent of x is 1 over 1 plus x squared. All right, so when we come over here and I take the derivative of arctangent of y, we should get 1 over 1 plus y squared, right? Am I done? Times what? dy dt. Now, why is this nicer than the other one? I forgot to pass out the sign-in sheet. You think we can do that in, in one minute, two minutes? Let's go fast. You'll find your name, you'll see today's date, just initial, and go quick. Why is this one better? Yeah, look, we, we want to know what d theta dt is, right? That's what we want? Good, OK. Now, we, do we have dy dt? Yes. What, do, what else do we need to know? Just what y is. And it's 3. See, we never had to solve for theta. Here you would have had to have solved for theta, right? Not that you couldn't, but do you see by making that quick switch, you just automatically eliminate that whole step of solving for theta. It's just nice. So we, we need to know that this sort of thing is in our arsenal. It's in our toolbox, right? So make sure you go and you look um, at all the, arc, uh, all the inverse trig functions and go look at their derivatives. In the homework, you'll have an opportunity to practice taking derivatives with them, all right? All right. Sign-in sheet's coming around. Any questions? Once you sign in, you're free to go. Any questions? Start the list.
listed homework. Start the listed homework, yep, for 3-5. Is it 3-5? It's, yeah, it's on there. Yeah, this was 3-5. Yes. Yeah, I'll put the examples up here that I want you to turn in next time. If you need to come up here and take a picture, you can. Have a great day, everybody.